Barrero vs. Garcia. Facts. Torts and damages, civil liability from quasi-delic vs. civil liability from crimes. At about 1.30 a.m. on May 3, 1936, Fontanilla's taxi collided with a Calesa, thereby killing the 16-year-old Faustino Garcia. Faustino's parents filed a criminal suit against Fontanilla and reserved their right to file a separate civil suit. Fontanilla was eventually convicted. After the criminal suit, Garcia filed a civil suit against Barredo, the owner of the taxi, employer Fontanilla. The suit was based on Article 1903 of the Civil Code, negligence of employers in the selection of their employees. Barredo assailed the suit arguing that his liability is only subsidiary and that the separate civil suit should have been filed against Fontanilla primarily and not him. Issue Whether or not Barredo is just subsidiarily liable. Help? No. He is primarily liable under Article 1903, which is a separate civil action against negligent employers. Garcia is well within his rights in suing Barredo. He reserved his right to file a separate civil action, and this is more expenditures because by the time of the Supreme Court judgment, Fontanilla is already serving his sentence and has no property. It was also proven that Barredo is negligent in hiring his employees because it was shown that Fontanilla had had multiple traffic infractions already before he hired him, something he failed to overcome during hearing. Had Garcia not reserved his right to file separate civil action, Barredo would have only been subsidiarily liable. Further, Barredo is not being sued for damages action from a criminal act, his driver's negligence, but rather for his own negligence in selecting his employee. Article 1903. Some of the differences between crimes under the Penal Code are 1. That crimes affect the public interest, while quasi delicts are only for private concern. Number 2. That consequently, the Penal Code punishes or corrects the criminal act, while the Civil Code, by means of indemnification, merely repairs the damage. Number 3. That delics are not as broad as quasi delics because for the former, are punished only if there is a penal law clearly covering them, while the latter, quasi delitos, include all acts in which any kind of fault or negligence intervenes. However, it should be noted that not all violations of the penal law produce civil responsibility, such as begging in contravention of ordinances, violation of the game laws, infraction of the rules of traffic when nobody is hurt. The foregoing authorities clearly demonstrate the separate individuality of quasi delic or culpa aquiliana under the civil code. Specifically, they show that there is a distinction between civil liability arising from criminal negligence governed by the Penal Code and responsibility for fault or negligence under Article 1902 to 1910 of the Civil Code, and that the same negligent act may produce either a civil liability arising from a crime under the Penal Code or a separate responsibility for fault or negligence under Articles 1902 to 1910 of the Civil Code, and that the same negligent act may produce either a civil liability arising from a crime under the Penal Code or a separate responsibility for fault or negligence. Elcano v. Hill Reginald Hill killed the son of plaintiff appellants. Agapito. After due trial, he was acquitted on the ground that his act was not criminal because of lack of intent to kill, coupled with mistake. Issues. Is the present civil action for damages barred by the acquittal of Reginald in the criminal case, wherein the action for civil liability was not reversed? Number two. May Article 2180, second and last paragraphs of the Civil Code, be applied against Attorney Hill, notwithstanding the undisputed fact that at the time of the occurrence complained of, Reginald, though a minor, 
living with and getting subsistence from his father, was already legally married. Held. In Barreto versus Garcia, it was held that the same given act can result in civil liability, not only under the penal code, but also under the civil code. In this jurisdiction, the separate individuality of a quasi delic or culpa aquiliana under the civil code has been fully and clearly recognized even with regard to a negligent act for which the wrongdoer could have been prosecuted and convicted in a criminal case and for which, after such conviction, he could have been sued for this civil liability arising from his crime. Firstly, the revised penal code in Articles 365 punishes not only reckless but also simple negligence. If we were to hold that Articles 1902 to 1910 of the Civil Code refer only to fault or negligence not punished by law, accordingly to the literal import of Article 1093 of the Civil Code, the legal institution of culpa aquiliana would have very little scope and application in actual life, death, or injury to persons and damage to property, through any degree of negligence, even the slightest would have to be indemnified only through the principle of civil liability arising from a crime. In such a state of affairs, what sphere would remain for quasi delito or culpa aquiliana? Secondary, to find that accused guilty as a criminal case, proof of guilt beyond reasonable doubt is required, while in a civil case, preponderance of evidence is sufficient to make the defendant pay in damages. There are numerous cases of criminal negligence which cannot be shown beyond reasonable doubt, but can be proved by a preponderance of evidence. In such cases, the defendant can and should be made responsible in a civil action under Articles 1902 to 1910 of the Civil Code. Otherwise, there would be many instances of unvindicated civil wrongs. Will be just indemnified remedium. Because of the broad sweep of the provisions of both the Penal Code and Civil Code on this subject, which has given rise to the overlapping or concurrence of spheres already discussed, and for a lack of understanding of the character and efficacy of the action for culpa aquiliana, there has grown up a common practice to seek damages only by virtue of the civil responsibility arising from a crime, forgetting that there is another remedy, which is by invoking Articles 1902 to 1910 of the Civil Code. We believe it is high time we pointed out to the harms done by such practice and to restore the principle of responsibility for fault or negligence under Articles 1902 of the Civil Code to its full rigor. It is high time we cause the stream of quasi-delic or culpa aquiliana to flow on its own natural channel so that its waters may no longer be diverted into that of a crime under the Penal Code. Therefore. Under the proposed Article 2177, acquittal from an accusation of criminal negligence, whether on reasonable doubt or not, shall not be a bar to a subsequent civil action, not for civil liability arising from criminal negligence, but for damages due to a quasi delic or culpa aquiliana. But said article forestalls a double recovery. The extinction of civil liability referred to in paragraph E of Section 3, Rule 111, refers exclusively to civil liability founded on Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code, whereas the civil liability for the same act considered as a quasi delic only and not for a crime is not extinguished even by a declaration in the criminal case that the criminal act charge has not happened or has not been committed by the accused. Briefly stated, we here hold, in reiteration of Garcia, that culpa aquiliana includes voluntary and negligent acts which may be punishable by law. It results, therefore, that the acquittal of Reginald Hill in the criminal case 
has not extinguished its liability for quasi delic hence the acquittal is not a bar to the instant action against him. Coming now to the second issue about the effect of Virginal's emancipation by marriage and the possible civil liability of Attorney Hill, his father, it is also a considered opinion that the conclusion of a police that Attorney Hill is already free from responsibility cannot be upheld. While it is true that parental authority is terminated upon emancipation of the child, Article 327, and under Article 397, emancipation takes place by the marriage of the minor child. It is, however, also clear that pursuant to Article 399, emancipation by marriage of the minor is not really full or absolute. Thus, emancipation by marriage or by voluntary concession shall terminate parental authority over the child's person. It shall enable the minor to administer his property as though he were of age, but he cannot borrow money or alienate or encumber real property without the consent of his father or mother or guardian. He can sue and be sued in court only with the assistance of his father, mother, or guardian. Now, under Article 2180, the obligation imposed by Article 2176 is demandable, not only for one's own acts or omissions, but also for those of persons for whom one is responsible, the father and, in case of his death or incapacity, the mother, are responsible. The father and, in case of death or incapacity, the mother, are responsible for the damages caused by the minor children who live in their company. In the instant case, it is not controverted that Reginald, although married, was living with his father and getting subsistence from him at the time of the occurrence in question. Factually, therefore, Reginald was still subservient to and dependent on his father, a situation which is not unusual. It must be borne in mind that, according to Manresa, the reason behind the joint and solidary liability of presumption with their offending child under Article 2180 as that as the obligation of the parent to supervise their minor children in order to prevent them from causing damage to third persons. On the other hand, the clear implication of Article 399 in providing that a minor emancipated by marriage may not, nevertheless, sue or be sued without the assistance of the parents, is that such emancipation does not carry with it freedom to enter into transactions or do any act that can give rise to judicial litigation. Accordingly, in our considered view, Article 2180 applies to Attorney Hill, notwithstanding the emancipation by marriage of Reginald. However, inasmuch as it is evident that Reginald is now of age as a matter of equity, the liability of Attorney Hill has become milling subsidiary to that of his son. Andamo versus IAC. Facts. Petitioner spouses Andamo owned a parcel of land situated in Silang, Cavite, which is adjacent to that of private respondent corporation, missionaries of Our Lady of La Salette, within the land of the latter. Water paths and contrivances, including an artificial lake, were constructed, which allegedly inundated and eroded petitioner's land, caused a young man to drown, damaged petitioner's crops and plants, washed away costly fences, endangered the lives of the petitioners and their laborers and some other destructions. This prompted petitioner's spouses to file a criminal action for destruction by means of inundation under Article 324 of the RPC and a civil action for damages issue. Whether petitioner spouses and damo can claim damages for destruction caused by respondents, water paths, and contrivances on the basis of Article 2176 and 2177 of the Civil Code on Quasidelics, held yes. A careful examination of the aforecoded complaint shows that the civil action is won under Articles 2176 and 2177 of the Civil Code on Quasidelics. All the elements of a quasidelic are present to it. A. Damages suffered by the plaintiff. B. 
fault or negligence of the defendant or some other person for whose acts he must respond and c the connection of cause and effect between the fault or negligence of the defendant and the damages incurred by the plaintiff clearly from petitioner's complaint the water paths and contrivances built by respondent corporation are alleged to have inundated the land of petitioners there is therefore an assertion of a causal connection between the act of building these water paths and the damage sustained by petitioners. Such action is proven constitutes fault or negligence, which may be the basis for the recovery of damages. It must be stressed that the use of one's property is not without limitations. Article 431 of the Civil Code provides that the owner of a thing cannot make use thereof in such manner as to injure the right of the third person sic utere tudu ut alinum non ledas moreover adjoining landowners have mutual and reciprocal duties which require that each must use his own land in a reasonable manner so as not to infringe upon the rights and interests of others although we recognize the right of an owner to build structures on his land such structures must be so constructed and maintained using all reasonable care so that they cannot be dangerous to adjoining landowners and can withstand the usual and expected forces of nature. If the structures cause injury or damage to an adjoining landowner or a third person, the latter can claim indemnification for the injury or damage suffered. L.J. Foods versus Philadelphia Agraviador and spouses Valerhera. Facts. On uh, February 26, 1996, Charles Valerhera, seven years old, was hit by a Ford Fiera owned by LG Foods and driven by Vicente Fur, employee. Charles died as a result. An information for reckless imprudence resulting to homicide was filed against Ferrer before the MTCC Bacolod City. However, before the trial could be concluded, Fur committed suicide. The MTC had dismissed the case. On June 23, 1999, in the RTC of Bacolod City, the spouses of Valejera filed a complaint for damages against LG Foods as employers of the deceased Fur. They alleged that as the employers, they had failed to exercise the due diligence in the selection and supervision of their employees. LG Foods denied liability for the death of Charles. They claimed that they had exercised the required due diligence in the selection and supervision of their employees. They moved for the dismissal of the complaint for lack of cause of action. LG Foods argued that the complaint is a claim for subsidiary liability against an employer under Article 103 of the Revised Penal Code. They contend that there must be first a judgment of conviction against Ferrer as a condition sine qua non to hold them liable and because Ferrer had died during the pendency of the criminal case then the sine qua non condition for their subsidiary liability was not fulfilled hence the lack of cause of action on the part of the spouses Valejera. On September 4, 2001 the trial court denied the motion to dismiss for lack of merit to add the case exacts responsibility for fault or negligence under Article 2176 of the Civil Code, which is entirely separate and distinct from the civil liability arising from negligence under the Revised Penal Code. They applied Article 2180 of the Civil Code in determining liability of LG Foods. Issue Is the cause of action of the spouses Valeria founded on Article 103 of the Revised Penal Code as LG Foods assert? or derived from Article 2180 of the Civil Code. The Supreme Court ruled that Article 2180 of the Civil Code is to be applied in this case. Under Article 2180, the liability of the employer is direct or immediate. It is not conditioned upon prior recourse against the negligent employee and a prior showing of insolvency of such employee. The complaint of the spouses Valejera had sufficiently alleged that the death of Charles was caused by the negligent act of LG Foods driver. Hence, LG Food is civilly liable for the negligence of their driver 
for failing to exercise the necessary diligence required of a good father of a family in the selection and supervision of their employee, the driver, which diligence, if exercised, would have prevented said accident. To add, the court also stated that victims of negligence or their ears have a choice between an action to enforce the civil liability arising from culpa criminal under Article 100 of the Revised Penal Code and an action for quasi-delic culpa aquiliana under Articles 2176 to 2194 of the Civil Code. Since Fair had committed suicide, the spouses Valihera had no other remedy but to sue LG Foods based on their direct and primary liability based on quasi delic Kanko versus Manila Railroad. Facts. Plaintiff Jose Kanko, an employee of Manila Railroad, was taking his daily train ride to the company's office in Manila on January 20th, 1915. Wow. As the train slowed down, Kanko stepped off, but one of or both his feet slipped on a sack of watermelons on the station's platform. Kanko's body rolled from the platform and was drawn under the moving car, where his right arm was crushed. The accident occurred between 7 and 8 p.m., and since the station was dimly lit by a single light, objects on the platform were difficult to see. On the other hand, the sack was placed along with others on the platform as a shipment to the market. Kanko then instituted a proceeding to recover damages in the court of first instance of Manila, founding his action on the negligence of Manila Railroad's employees in placing the sacks on the platform. However, the judge ruled that Kanko failed to use due caution in alighting from the train. Issues. Whether or not defendant Manila Railroad is liable for damages, yes. Whether or not plaintiff Kanko is liable for contributory negligence, no. Doctrines. Article 2176, whoever by act or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence, is obliged to pay for the damage done. Such fault or negligence, if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between the parties, is called quasi-delic and is governed by the provisions of this chapter. Article 2180, the obligation imposed by Article 2176 is demandable, not only for one's own acts or omission, but also for those of persons for whom one is responsible. Employers shall be liable for the damages caused by their employees and household helpers acting within the scope of their assigned tasks, even though the former are not engaged in any business or industry. The responsibility treated in this article shall cease when the persons herein mentioned prove that they observe all the diligence of a good father of a family to prevent damage. On the distinction between culpa contractual and culpa aquiliana, in his commentary on Article 1903 of the Old Civil Code, Manresa says that the liability arising from extra contractual or culpa is always based on a voluntary act or omission which causes damage not through willful intent, but through mere negligence or inattention. Therefore, an act or omission may be voluntary but not willful, that is, with intent to harm. Culpa aquiliana can be further distinguished from culpa contractual in the following ways. Source, extra contractual obligations have their source and those mutual duties which civilized society imposes upon his members, the breach of which give rise to an obligation to indemnify the injury or injured party. As such, in cases of culpa aquiliana, it is the wrongful or negligent act or omission that creates the vinculum juris, whereas in contractual relations, the vinculum exists independently of the breach. Burden of proof. In culpa aquiliana, where the plaintiff's cause of action depends on a negligent act or omission, the burden of proof rests upon the plaintiff to prove negligence. On the other hand, since an obligation already exists in culpa contractual, mere proof of the contract and of its non-performance are sufficient prima facie for a recovery. Defense of employer for negligence of employee. 
The presumption of negligence in Article 1903 is rebuttable, and the employer is relieved of liability upon proof that he has exercised due diligence in the selection and supervision of employees. However, the same does not apply in culpa contractual. The court also describes the fields of contractual and non-contractual obligations as concentric. That is to say, the fact that a person is bound to another by contract does not relieve him from extra contractual liability to the latter. On the liability of Defendant Manila Railroad to Plaintiff Kanko, the foundation of defendant's liability is its contract of carriage with plaintiff, which carries by implication the duty to carry him safely and provides safe means of entering and leaving its trains. Thus, non-performance of the contract could not be excused by proof that the fault was imputable to defendant's employees. On plaintiff's lack of contributory negligence, Thompson defines the test to determine whether a passenger alighting from a moving train is guilty of negligence as that of ordinary or reasonable care. In the instant case, not only was the station dimly lit and the train barely moving, but plaintiff is a fit young man for whom alighting a moving train would not be risky. Our conclusion is that the conduct of the plaintiff in undertaking to alight while the train was yet slightly underway was not characterized by imprudence and that therefore he was not guilty of contributory negligence. It may be noted that the place was perfectly familiar to the plaintiff as it was his daily custom to get on and off the train at this station. There could therefore be no uncertainty in his mind with regard either to the length of the steps which he was required to take or the character of the platform where he was alighting. Our conclusion is that the conduct of the plaintiff in undertaking to alight while the train was yet slightly underway was not characterized by imprudence and that therefore he was not guilty of contributory negligence. Kalalas versus CA. Facts. Elisa Sunga, private respondent, took a passenger jeepney owned and operated by Kalalas. As the jeepney was filled to capacity 24 passengers, Sunga was given by the conductor an extension seat, a wooden stool at the back of the door at the end of the vehicle. The jeepney stopped to let a passenger off. As she was seated at the rear of the vehicle, Sunga gave way to the outgoing passenger. Just as she was doing so, an Isuzu truck driven by Iglesario Virina and owned by Francisco Salva bumped the left rear portion of the jeepney. As a result, Sunga was injured. She sustained a fracture of the distal third of the left tibia fibula with severe necrosis of the underlying skin. Sunga filed a complaint for damages against Kalalas, alleging violation of the contract of carriage by the former in failing to exercise the diligence required of him as a common carrier. Kalalas, on the other hand, filed a third-party complaint against Francisco Salva the owner of the Isuzu truck. The RTC judgment against Salva as third-party defendant and absolved Kalalas of liability, holding that it was the driver of the Isuzu truck who was responsible for the accident. It took cognizance of the other case, civil case, filed by Kalalas against Salva and Virina for quasi delic The CA reversed, and the cause of action was based on a contract of carriage not quasi-delic, and that the common carrier failed to exercise the diligence required under the civil code. The appellate court dismissed the third-party complaint against Salva and adjudged Kalalas liable for damages to Sunga. Kalalas, the bumping of the jeepney by the truck owned by Salva, was a caso for Tuido. Petitioner further assails the award of moral damages to Sunga on the ground that it is not supported by evidence. Issue, whether or not taking the extension seat was an implied assumption of risk. Held no. The civil case cannot bind Sunga. The civil case involved quasi delic while this case involves culpa contractual, breach of contract of carriage. In the case of death, injuries to passengers, 
Article 1756 of the Civil Code provides that common carriers are presumed to have been at fault or to have acted negligently unless they prove that they observe extraordinary diligence as defined in Articles 733 and 1755 of the Code. This provision necessarily shifts to the common carrier the burden of proof. It is immaterial that the proximate cause of the collision between the jeepney and the truck was the negligence of the truck driver. The doctrine of proximate cause is applicable only in actions for quasi delic not in actions involving breach of contract. In the case of Barr, upon the happening of the accident, the presumption of negligence at once arose and it became the duty of petitioner to prove that he observed extraordinary diligence and the care of his passengers. Did the driver of the jeepney carry Sunga safely as far as human care and foresight could provide, using the utmost diligence of very cautious persons, with due regard of all the circumstances as required by Article 1755? We do not think so. A. The jeepney was not properly parked, its rear portion being exposed about two meters from the broad shoulders of the highway and facing the middle of the highway, in a diagonal angle in violation of the Land Transportation and Traffic Code. B. And disputed that petitioner's driver took in more passengers than the allowed seating capacity of the jeepneys, a violation of the same law. Section 32. The fact that Sunga was seated in an extension seat placed her in a peril greater than that of which the other passengers were exposed. Therefore, not only was petitioner unable to overcome the presumption of negligence imposed on him for the injury sustained by Sunga, but also the evidence shows he was actually negligent in transporting passengers. We find it hard to give serious thought to petitioner's contention that Sunga's taking an extension seat amounted to an implied assumption of risk. It is akin to arguing that the injuries to the many victims of the tragedies in our seas should not be compensated merely because those passengers assume a greater risk of drowning by boarding an overload ferry. This is also true of petitioner's contention that the jeepney being bumped while it was improperly parked constitute caso fortuito. A caso fortuito is an event which could not be foreseen, or which, though foreseen, was inevitable. This requires that the following requirements be present. A. The cause of the breach is independent of the debtor's will. B. The event is unforeseeable or unavoidable. C. The event is such as to render it impossible for the debtor to fulfill his obligation in a normal manner. And D. The debtor did not take part in the causing the injury to the creditor. Petitioner should have foreseen the danger of parking his chimney with its body protruding two meters into the highway. Flores versus Miranda. Respondent Irenio Miranda was aboard a jeep driven by Eugenio Luga. When the latter lost control of it as it was speeding down Santa Mesa Bridge, the vehicle swerved and hit the bridge wall, injuring passengers, including respondent who had to undergo three operations. One, to wind wire loops around his broken bones. Two, to insert a metal splint. And three, to remove said splint. The Jeep was owned by Paz Forest, being registered in her name and having the name Doña Paz painted below its windshield. Issue, whether or not an action for the breach of contract embodies an action on tort. Held, no. The difference in conditions, defenses and proof as well as the caudal concept of quasi delic as essentially extra-contractual negligence compel us to differentiate between action ex-contractual, action arising from a contract, and actions quasi ex delicto quasi delic and prevent us from viewing the action for breach of contract as simultaneously embodying an action on tort. Thus, the moral damages ordered to be paid to respondent must be discarded, as such are not recoverable in damage actions predicted on a breach of contract of transportation. The term analogous cases in Article 2219 
does not include quasi-delict because the definition of quasi-delict in Article 2176 of the Code expressly excludes the cases where there is a pre-existing relation between the parties, while Article 220 requires bad faith in the contractual breach of damages to be recovered. The court held that the award of moral damages is not proper in this case. As a general rule, moral damages are not awarded to the victim in cases of breach of contract of common carriage. The exception is that if such accident resulted in the death of the passenger, in which case Article 1764 of the New Civil Code makes the carrier subject to Article 2206 of the New Civil Code in case of death did not result from the accident. Moral damages may be recovered if the common carrier is found guilty of gross negligence amounting to bad faith or malice. In the case of Barr, there was no bad faith on the part of the common carrier. Therefore, respondent is not entitled to moral damages. As to the issue of attorney's fees, the court may motu proprio award moral damages as the case may be. Attorney's fees may be awarded by the court if it is deemed to be just and equitable. Therefore, the court set aside the decision of the Court of Appeals as far as moral damages are concerned. Consolidated Bank and LCDS Company Facts LCDS or LC to its cashier Mercedes Macaraya or Macaraya sent Ismael Calarpe, Calarpe to deposit money with Solid Bank. He went to teller number six and left with her two deposit slips and a passbook as he had some business with Allied Bank. When Kalarpa came back, the passbook was already gone as someone had already taken it, and as stated by the teller, the teller could not remember who had taken it. On a latter day, teller number six gave Makaraya deposit slip for the deposit of a check from Philippine Banking Corporation, PBC. But the same was dishonored as the account of the check had already been closed. LCDS through its CEO, Luis Diaz, called up Solid Bank to stop any transaction from the missing passbook until they could open a new account. On the same day, it was found out that there was an unauthorized withdrawal worth 300000 which had authorized signatories who were Diaz and Rustico, Murillo. Diaz and Rustico. Such signatories denied signing the same, and a certain Noel Tamayo or Tamayo received the 300k. A case was filed against Emirano Ilig Ilagan and Roscon Verdazola for a stafa and falsification of commercial document. LC, through its counsel, demanded Solid Bank to return the money, but they refused. Hence, Elsie filed a complaint for the recovery of sum of money against Solid Bank before the RTC of Manila. The RTC absolved Solid Bank and dismissed the complaint stating that there was a presumption of ownership on those who possesses the passbook and that the depositor should have kept the passbook under lock and key. The CA reversed the decision stating that it should have exercised diligence that was more than a good father of a family as the bank is impressed with public interest. Issue, whether Solid Bank is liable due to quasi delic No, Solid Bank is liable for the loss of the 300,000 based on the ground of culpa contractual. The contract between the bank and its depositor is governed by the provision of the Civil Code on Simple Loan, Article 1980 of Civil Code. There is a debtor-creditor relationship between the bank and its depositor. The bank is the debtor and the depositor is the creditor. The depositor lends the bank money and the bank agrees to pay the depositor on demand. The savings deposit agreement between the bank and the depositor is the contract that determines the rights and obligations of the parties. Under their contract, it is the duty of LCDS to secure its passbook. However, this duty is also applicable to Solid Bank when it gains possession of said passbook which it did when the messenger left it to the bank's possession through the bank's teller. The act of the teller returning the passbook to someone else other than Calarpe, the firm's authorized messenger, is a clear breach of contract. Such negligence binds 
the bank under the principle of respondent superior or command responsibility. However, mitigating damages must be applied since under Article 1172 liability for a culpa contractual may be regulated by the courts according to the circumstances. This means that if the defendant exercised the proper diligence in the selection and supervision of its employee, or if the plaintiff was guilty of contributory negligence, then the courts may reduce the award of damages. In this case, LCD was, was guilty of contributory negligence in allowing withdrawal slips signed by its authorized signatories to fall into the hands of an impostor. Thus, the liability of Solid Bank should be reduced. Wherefore, the decision of the Court of Appeals is affirmed with modification. Petitioner Solid Bank shall pay private respondent LCDS and company. CPS only 60% of the actual damages awarded by the Court of Appeals. The remaining 40 of the actual damages shall be borne by private respondent LCDS and company. Faris Bank versus CA. Facts. Private respondent Luisa A. Luna applied for and was accorded a Far East card issued by petitioner Far East Bank and Trust Company. Clarita informed Far East Bank, Trust and Company that she lost her credit card. In order to replace the lost card, Clarita submitted an affidavit of loss. In case of this nature, the bank's internal security procedures and policy would be to record the lost card along with the principal card as a hot card or canceled card in its master file. Lewiston tendered a despedida lunch for a close friend. When he presented his Faris card to pay for the lunch, the card was not honored, forcing him to pay in cash the bill. Naturally, Luis felt embarrassed by this incident. Private respondent Luis Luna, through counsel, demanded from Far East Bank Trust and Company the payment of damages. Adrian Festejo, a vice president of the bank, expressed the bank's apologies, admitting that they have failed to inform Luis about its security policy. Private respondents then filed a complaint for damages in the RTC, which rendered a decision ordering FEBTC to pay private respondents moral damages, exemplary damages, and attorney's fees. Issue whether or not private respondents are entitled of moral damages. Held no. In culpa contractual, moral damages may be recovered where the defendant is shown to have acted in bad faith or with malice in the breach of the contract. Concededly, the bank was negligent for failing to inform Luis of his own card's cancellation. Nothing in the findings of the trial court and the appellate court can sufficiently indicate any deliberate intent on the part of FEBTC to cause harm to private respondents. The failure to inform Luis is not considered to be so gross that it would amount to malice or bad faith. Malice or bad faith implies a conscious and intentional design to do a wrongful act for a dishonest purpose or moral obliquity. It is different from the negative idea of negligence and that malice or bad faith contemplates a state of mind affirmatively operating with a furtive design or ill will. Article 21 of the Code contemplates a conscious act to cause harm. In relation to a breach of contract, its application can be warranted only when the defendant's disregard of his contractual obligation is so deliberate as to approximate a degree of misconduct certainly no less worse than fraud or bad faith. Most importantly, Article 21 is a mere declaration of a general principle in human relations that clearly must, in any case, give way to the specific provision of Article 2220 of the Civil Code, authorizing the grant of moral damages in culpa contractual solely when the breach is due to fraud or bad faith. The decision is modified by deleting the award of moral and exemplary damages to private respondents. In its stead, petitioner is ordered to pay nominal damages sanctioned under Article 2221 of the Civil Code. 
FGU Insurance Corporation versus Sarmiento Trucking Corporation. Facts: P. Sarmiento Trucking Corporation or GPS undertook to deliver on June 18, 1994, 30 units of Condura white refrigerators driven by Lambert Eroles from the plant side of Conception Industries in Metro Manila to the Central Luzon Appliances in the Guban City. On its way, it collided with an unidentified truck, causing it to fall into a deep canal, resulting in damage to the cargoes. FDU Insurance Corporation, an insurer of the shipment, paid to Conception Industries the value of the covered cargoes in the sum of 204,450 pesos. FGU, in turn, being the subrogy of the rights and interests of Conception Industries, sought reimbursement of the amount it had paid to the latter from GPS. Since the trucking company failed to hit the claim, FGU filed a complaint for damages and breach of contract of carriage against GPS and its driver, Lambert Rolles. In its answer, respondents asserted that GPS was the exclusive hauler only of Conception Industries since 1988, and it was not so engaged in business as a common carrier. Issue, whether respondent GPS may be considered as a common carrier as defined under the law and existing jurisprudence. Number two, whether respondent GPS, either as a common carrier or a private carrier, may be presumed to have been negligent when the goods it undertook to transport safely were subsequently damaged while in its protective custody and possession. And number three, whether the doctrine of res ipsa locator is applicable in the instant case held. On the first issue, the court finds the conclusion of the trial court and the court of appeals to be amply justified. GPS, being an exclusive contractor and holder of Conception Industries, rendering or offering its services to no other individual or entity, cannot be considered a common carrier. Common carriers are persons, corporations, firms, or associations engaged in the business of carrying or transporting passengers or goods or both by land, water, or air for hire or compensation, offering their services to the public. Given accepted standards, GPS scarcely falls within the term common carrier. The above conclusion notwithstanding, GPS cannot escape from liability. In COPA contractual, upon which the action of petitioner rests as being the subrogy of conception industries, the mere proof of the existence of the contract and the failure of its compliance justify prima facie a corresponding right of relief. The law, recognizing the obligatory force of contracts, will not permit a party to be set free from liability for any kind of misperformance of the contractual undertaking or a contravention of the tenor thereof. A breach upon the contract confers upon the injured party a valid cost for recovering that which may have been lost or suffered. The effect of every infraction is to create a new duty, that is, to make recompense to the one who has been injured by the failure of another to observe his contractual obligation, unless he can show extenuating circumstances like proof of his exercise of the due diligence or of the attendance of fortuitous event to excuse him from his ensuing liability. Respondent Tracking Corporation recognizes the existence of a contract of carriage between it and petitioners assured and admits that the cargoes it has assumed to deliver have been lost or damaged while in its custody. In such a situation, a default on or failure of compliance with the obligation, in this case, the delivery of the goods in its custody to the place of destination gives rise to a presumption of lack of care and corresponding liability on the part of the contractual obligor, the burden being on him to establish otherwise. GPS has failed to do so. Respondent driver, on the other hand, without concrete proof of his negligence or fault, may not himself be ordered to pay petitioner. 
the driver not being a party to the contract of carriage between petitioners, principal and defendant, may not be held liable under the agreement. A contract can only bind the parties who have entered into it, or their successors who have assumed their personality or their juridical position. Consonantly with the axiom res inter alias, acta, alis, nici, noset, prodest, such contract can neither favor nor prejudice a third person. Petitioner's civil action against the driver can only be based on culpa aquiliana, which, unlike culpa contractual, would require the claimant for damages to prove negligence or fault on the part of the defendant. A word in passing, res ipsa locutor. A doctrine being invoked by petitioner holds a defendant liable where the thing which caused the injury complained of is shown to be under the latter's management and the accident is such that, in the ordinary course of things, cannot be expected to happen if those who have its management or control use proper care. It is not a rule of substantive law, and as such, it does not create an independent ground of liability. Instead, it is regarded as a mode of proof or a mere procedural convenience since it furnishes a substitute for and relieves the plaintiff of the burden of producing specific proof of negligence. The maxim simply places on the defendant the burden of going forward with the proof. Resort to doctrine, however, may be allowed only when a. the event is of a kind which does not ordinarily occur in the absence of negligence, b. other responsible causes, including the conduct of plaintiff and third persons, are sufficiently eliminated by the evidence, and c. the indicated negligence is within the scope of the defendant's duty to the plaintiff. Thus, it is not applicable when an unexplained accident may be attributable to one of several causes, for some of which the defendant could not be responsible. Sikia versus CA Facts Juan Sikia, father of the deceased Vicente Sikia, entered in a contract of deed of sale and internment order with Manila Memorial Park, MMPCI. In the contract, there contained a provision which stated that the coffin would be placed in a sealed concrete vault to protect the remains of the deceased from the elements. During the preparation for the transfer of Vicente's remains in the newly vault lot in Manila Memorial, it was discovered that there was a hole in the concrete vault which caused total flooding inside, damaged the coffin, as well as the body of the deceased and covered the same with filth. Sikia filed a complaint for recovery of damages arising from breach of contract and or quasi delic against the MMPCI for failure to deliver it a defect-free concrete vault to protect the remains of the deceased. In its defense, MMPCI claimed that the boring of the hole was necessary in order to prevent the vault from floating when water fills the grave. The trial court dismissed the complaint holding that there was no quasi delic because defendant is not guilty of any fault or negligence and because there was a pre-existing contract between the parties. The CA affirmed the decision of the trial court. Issue whether or not the private respondent is guilty of tort. Held. Denied. Decision of the CA affirmed. We are more inclined to answer the foregoing questions in the negative. There is not enough ground, both in fact and in law, to justify reversal of the decision of the respondent court and to uphold the pleas of the petitioners. Although a pre-existing contractual relation between the parties does not preclude the existence of a culpa aquiliana, we find no reason to disregard the respondent's court's finding that there was no negligence. Article 2176, whoever by act or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence, is obliged to pay for the damage done. Such fault or negligence if there is no pre-existing contractual relation between the parties is called quasi -delic. In this case, it has been established that the Sikias in the Manila Memorial Park Cemetery entered into a contract entitled Deed of Sale 
and Certificate of Perpetual Care on August 27, 1969. That agreement governed the relations of the parties and defined their respective rights and obligations. Hence, had there been actual negligence on the part of the Manila Memorial Park Cemetery, it would be held liable, not for quasi-delic or culpa aquiliana, but for culpa contractual as provided by Article 1170 of the Civil Code. Those who, in the performance of their obligations, are guilty of fraud, negligence, or delay, and those who in any manner contravene the tenor thereof, are liable for damages. PSBA versus CA Facts Carlitos Bautista was a third-year student at the Philippine School of Business Administration. Assailants who were not members of the school academic community while in the premises of B SBA stabbed Bautista to death. This incident prompted his parents to file a suit against PSBA and its corporate officers for damages due to their alleged negligence, recklessness, and lack of security precautions, means, and methods before, during, and after the attack on the victim. The defendants filed a motion to dismiss claiming that the complaint states no cause of action against them based on quasi-delic. As the said rule does not cover academic institutions, the trial court denied the motion to dismiss. Their motion for reconsideration was likewise dismissed and was affirmed by the appellate court. Issue whether or not PSBA is liable for the death of the student. Ruling. Because the circumstances of the present case evince a contractual relation between the PSBA and Carlitos Bautista, the rules on quasi delic do not really govern. A perusal of Article 2176 shows that obligations arising from quasi delics or tort, also known as extra contractual obligations, arise only between parties not otherwise bound by contract, whether expressed or implied. However, this impression has not prevented this court from determining the existence of a tort even when there obtains a contract. Article 2180 in conjunction with Article 2176 of the Civil Code, establishes the rule. In loco parentis, Article 2180 provides that the damage should have been caused or inflicted by pupils or students of the educational institution sought to be held liable for the acts of its pupils or students while in its custody. However, this material situation does not exist in the present case, for as earlier indicated, the assailants of Carlitos were not students of the PBS or PSBA, for whose acts the school could be made liable, but it does not necessarily follow that PSBA is absolved from liability. When an academic institution accepts students for enrollment, there is established a contract between them, resulting in bilateral obligations which both parties is bound to comply with. For its part, the school undertakes to provide the student with an education that would presumably suffice to equip him with the necessary tools and skills to pursue higher education or a profession. This includes ensuring the safety of the students while in the school premises. On the other hand, the student covenants to abide by the school's academic requirements and observe its rules and regulation. In the circumstances obtaining in the case at bar, however, there is as yet no finding that the contract between the school and Bautista had been breached through the former's negligence in providing proper security measures. This would be for the trial court to determine, and even if there be a finding of negligence, the same could give rise generally to a breach of contractual obligation only. Using the test of Kanko Supra, the negligence of the school would not be relevant absent a contract. In fact, that negligence becomes material only because of the contractual relation between PSBA and Bautista. In other words, a contractual relation is a condition sine qua non to the school's liability. The school cannot exist independently of the contract unless the negligence occurs under the circumstances set out in Article 21 of the Civil Code. Light Rail Transit versus Navidad. Facts. On October 14, 1993, Nicanor Navidad, then drunk, entered the EDSA LRT station after purchasing a token representing payment of the fare. 
While Navidad was standing on the platform near the LRT tracks, Junalito S. Curtin, the security guard assigned to the area, approached Navidad, and a misunderstanding or an altercation between the two apparently ensued that led to a fist fight. Navidad later fell on the LRT tracks. At the exact moment that Navidad fell, an LRT train operated by petitioner Rodolfo Roman was coming in. Navidad was struck by the moving train and he was killed instantaneously. A complaint for damages was then filed against Escartin, Roman, the LRT, the Metro Transit Organization, and Prudent for the death of Navidad. The RTC then held that Prudent and Escartin were liable and it ordered them to pay jointly and severally the damages for the death of Navidad. On appeal, the CA exonerated Prudent and Escartin from any liability for the death of Navidad and held that LRT and Roman jointly and severally liable. It ruled that the contract of carriage had already existed when Navidad entered the place where passengers were supposed to be after paying the fare and getting the corresponding token therefore. Issue, whether or not the LRT and Roman are liable for the death of Navidad. Ruling, the law requires common carriers to carry passengers safely using the utmost diligence of very cautious persons with due regard of all circumstances. Such duty of a common carrier to provide safely to its passengers so obligates it not only during the course of the trip, but for so long as the passengers are within its premises and where they ought to be in pursuance to the contract of carriage. Thus, in this case, the foundation of LRTA's liability is the contract of carriage and its obligation to indemnify the victim arises from the breach of that contract by reason of its failure to exercise the high diligence required of the common carrier. In the discharge of its commitment to ensure the safety of passengers, a carrier may choose to hire its own employees or avail itself of the services of an outsider or an independent firm to undertake the task. In either case, the common carrier is not relieved of its responsibilities under the contract of carriage. On the other hand, there is no showing that petitioner Roman himself is guilty of any culpable act or omission. He must also be absolved from liability. Needless to say, the contractual tie between the LRT and Navidad is not itself a juridical relation between the latter and R Roman. Thus, Roman can be made liable only for his own fault or negligence.